This is All India Radio. We now bring you a special program, Preparations for India's 73rd Republic Day Celebrations. January 26th, a red letter day in the history of independent India, the day from which its constitution came into effect and India was declared a republic way back in 1950. The occasion is marked by a grand parade showcasing the might of Indian armed forces and the glimpses of the rich culture and heritage of the country with dancers, tableau and the brave children on the Rajpath. This year's Republic Day falls in the 75th year of India's independence, being celebrated as Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. This year, the Republic Day is going to be unique in quite a few aspects, retaining the grandeur and flavor of yesteryears. It comes in the backdrop of the third wave of COVID-19 pandemic, and hence the celebrations are going to be a tad different. January 23rd is the birth anniversary of great freedom fighter Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. It is the 125th anniversary of Subhash Chandra Bose and to mark this occasion, it has been decided that Republic Day celebrations will be from January 23rd onwards till January 30th, which is observed as the Martyr's Day in the country. The Republic Day Parade will begin at 10.30 a.m. instead of 10 a.m. to provide better visibility to the parade and fly past. In addition to this, 10 large LED screens on both sides, 5 on each of Rajpath, will also be installed for spectators to watch. This would also reduce crowding at any specific location. After the floral wreath-laying ceremony, the President of India, Ramnath Kovind, will unfurl the national flag. Then he will take the salute by the marching contingents along the Rajpath. The parade will witness the traditional march pass by the contingents of the armed forces, paramilitary forces, Delhi Police, National Cadet Corps, NCC, National Service Scheme, NSS, and Indian Scouts and Guides. Before the commencement of the parade, the contingents of Central Armed Police Forces will undertake static band performances in the seating enclosures of Rajpath. This year, 12 states, union territories and 9 ministries and departments will display their tableau on various themes under Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. These include the tableau of Arbindo Ghosh and Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. 10 scrolls, each of 75 meters in length and 15 feet in height, will showcase the unsung heroes of the freedom struggle and our rich cultural heritage of indigenous and contemporary visual art practices. These scrolls will be displayed along Rajpath during the Republic Day Parade. For the first time, dancers who perform during the cultural program at the Republic Day Parade have been selected through a nationwide competition, Vande Bharatam. They will showcase their talent during the parade at Rajpath. <laughs>
in yet another unique feature this time more than 100 female troops from across different military ranks will be performing at the Republic Day parade these include their daredevil stunts at Vijay Chowk border security forces all women biker team Seema Bhavani will also be spotted showcasing their stunts at the parade आपकी सहयोग और आत्मविश्वास के साथ एक मोटरसाइकिल पर आगे बढ़ते हुए छह सीमा भवानी हमारे राष्ट्रीय पक्षी मोर की फॉर्मेशन में अद्भुत संतुलन का नमूना पेश करते हुए सबसे विशेष डिस्प्लेइंग परफेक्ट एग्जांपल ऑफ म्यूचुअल कोऑपरेशन कोऑर्डिनेशन एंड सेल्फ कॉन्फिडेंस द फॉर्मेशन लेड बाय लेडी कांस्टेबल राजपाल कौर और अब पांच मोटरसाइकिल पर तीस जांबाज सीमा भवानी पांच कमल के फूलों का गुलदस्ता लेकर आ रही हैं। आगे बढ़ रही हैं महिला आरक्षक विजेता भालेराव भाग्यश्री शोभना चौधरी मनदीप कौर और आरती पैंकरा दिस ईयर फ्लाई पास्ट विल फीचर 75 फाइव एयरक्राफ्ट टू कमेमोरेट द कंट्रीज सेवेंटी फिफ्थ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ इंडिपेंडेंस विंटेज एज वेल एज करंट मॉडर्न एयरक्राफ्ट लाइक रफाल Sukhoi, Jaguar, MI-17, Sarang, Apache and Dakota will be showcased. The fly past will witness 15 different formations by these aircraft and helicopters. Visitors will see some unseen sights from the cockpits of fighter jets performing maneuvers for the first time. Flying at a speed of 900 kilometers per hour, carrying out a vertical challenge. Absolutely gravity defying. The celebrations will culminate with beating the retreat ceremony on the last day of the celebrations on January 29th at Vijay Chowk. The military bands will perform martial tunes. The star attraction will be hundreds of drones swarming the skies for the first time ever. The show would be of 10 minutes duration involving around 1000 drones fabricated through indigenous technology. Synchronized background music will be played during the drone show. In keeping with the celebrations of 75th year of India's independence, "Aye Mere Watan Ke Logon" will be played at the beating the retreat ceremony. An Indian tune and pays respect to all who laid down their lives for the safety and integrity of the nation.
3 to 4 minutes will commemorate 75 years of independence before the end of the beating the retreat ceremony. Seats have been reserved for auto rickshaw drivers, construction workers, Safai workers, frontline health workers in both in Republic Day Parade as well as in the Beating the Retreat ceremony. The invitation cards for Republic Day Parade and the Beating the Retreat this time are eco-friendly and relevant for COVID times. These cards will have seeds of medicinal plants of ashwagandha, aloe vera and amla embedded in it and people are being encouraged to plant it in their gardens and flower pots after use. A dedicated website, mobile app and social media handles are already functioning giving real-time updates of the events being held in the run-up to Republic Day celebrations 2022. The website is www.indianrdc.mod.gov.in and the mobile app is Republic Day India. MyGov has launched a digital initiative to encourage people to show solidarity with the Republic Day. This entails a swift registration through mobile, watch the parade and vote for the best marting contingent, tableau and cultural performance. Giving prime importance to COVID safety protocols, the number of invited guests for Republic Day parade ceremony has been reduced. Only double vaccinated invitees are permitted for the sake of guest safety. Guests have also been asked to keep a six-foot distance from the enclosures, wear masks and obey other COVID regulations. The states and UTs have been advised that they should invite participation from one or more other states for the Republic Day Parade. This will enhance mutual understanding and bonding in the spirit of Ek Bharat Shresht Bharat. As India celebrates the 73rd Republic Day tomorrow, now let us listen to the excerpts from the discussion on making of Indian Constitution. The participants are Dr. Subhash Kashyap, former Secretary General Lok Sabha, Professor Shubhrata Mukherjee, political analyst, and Kumar Dhananjay, journalist. On 26th January 1950, India joined the ranks of democratic nations with a constitution in effect and practice. In its nascent stage, and recovering from a colonial past, India resolved to secure a democratic nation's future and provide, and I quote, to all the people of India, justice, social, economical and political, equality of status, of opportunity and before the law, freedom of thought and expression, belief, faith, worship, among many goals. The people who wrote it translated a dream to document. That dream and document still guides our polity and daily life. On this Republic Day, it will be refitting to take a look back and reflect on it. Mr. Subhas Kashyap, this is a moment to celebrate the country's rich legacy as a republic, to pay tribute to all those who helped it evolve as a constitutional democracy, and also to reiterate the commitment to preserve it. There were lots of debates before we adopted this constitution. For the benefit of our listeners, can you go back to that and talk about it, that what were the debates and how this constitution came into? First, the constitution was adopted, enacted and given to ourselves by the people of India in their Constitutional Assembly on 26 November 1949. The whole constitution came into force on 26 January 1950 when India became a sovereign democratic republic. So far as constitution making is concerned, the Constitutional Assembly started functioning in 1946. And uh, the first thing that the Constitutional Assembly did after the election of the President, as you know, Dr. Ajahn Prashad was elected the President. The, one of the first things done was to appoint a number of committees. And uh, these committees were assigned different roles. There were, for example, Provincial Constitution Committee, the Union Constitution Committee, the Fundamental Rights Minorities and Excluded Areas Committee and several others. Simultaneously, the constitutions of more than 60 nations were scanned 
and extracts from these constitutions were printed in three volumes called Constitutional Precedents. These three volumes of Constitutional Precedents were distributed to all the members of the Constitutional Assembly for them to see what are the provisions in other constitutions of the world. But uh, basically, my personal opinion is that Government of India Act 1935 was largely used as the working draft and to this were added some provisions like directive principles taken from the Irish constitution, some fundamental rights taken from the American constitution, the British Bill of Rights and largely from the Motilal Nehru Committee Report in 1928 which also had a chapter on fundamental rights. After the committees reported, the reports of committees were considered by the Constituent Assembly. There were very animated debates on some of them and uh, some decisions were taken by the Constituent Assembly. Thereafter, a draft by the research division of the Constituent Assembly headed by Serbi and Rao, they took up the task of preparing the first draft constitution of India, which was based largely on decisions of the Constitutional Assembly, but where committee reports had not been considered there, it was largely based on these committee reports. And where neither of the two were available, then the Constitutional Advisor, the Research Division of the Constitutional Assembly, they made their own suggestions. That was the first draft of the Constitution, which came in 1947. Thereafter, the Constitutional Assembly continued its deliberations, but thereafter, a drafting committee was appointed with uh, Dr. Ambedkar as the head. There were other very eminent members like K. M. Munshi, Allah Di Krishna Swami Iyer, Muhammad Sadullah and others. Then this drafting committee considered the decisions of the Constitutional Assembly, the reports of the committees, the constitutional precedents and basically first draft constitution prepared by the constitutional advisor and it made a report to the Constitutional Assembly. That draft constitution which was then prepared by the drafting committee was considered clause by clause by the Constituent Assembly and decisions were taken. There was a long process thereafter also another draft came and all that I would not go into the details but then the Constituent Assembly took the decision. You also quoted part of the preamble to the Constitution. I would submit that the first words of the that preamble are very important. The preamble begins by the words, we the people of India. So the very first thing that the constitution makers wanted to emphasize in the preamble itself was that, number one, we the people of India are one. There is no separate citizenship for any territories, states or provinces, whatever you call it. Professor Mukherjee, the second part of it that I wanted to discuss that the framers of the constitution displayed a remarkable foresight drafting its uh, amendment provisions. They were acutely aware that the constitution they had drafted should neither be too rigid or too flexible. We have evolved as a country since 1947. Do you think the amendments that we have seen in the constitution has been in sync, which is more than 100 by now, has been in sync with the evolving Indian society or it was more political in it? Well, normally the American example is given. Because since they have so few amendments, how come India has so many? But I think the basic uh, reason for this, we must understand, you know, is that uh, United States is a country of minor contradictions. India is a country of major contradictions. And uh, Ambedkar was very clear about it. He made a very interesting point. He said the Indian democracy is actually something like a icing in the cake and the entire societal order is uh, non-democratic. So, in that kind of a situation, the divisions within society and other contradictions really call for amendments much more than any settled, well-ordered democracy. And there, I think as you point out, that the process of amendment has been really quite easy and that was a requirement. For instance, a simple case, 
if you really look to the reservation problem. You know, first you say it's for 10 years and then you know, extend it. But if you really you follow the logic of Ambedkar, then it is to continue for much longer. But then, you know, you cannot give a shock by saying that it will be there for 50 years or so in a new republic. So the entire process of accommodation and contradiction could take place by amendments. But that does not mean that all the amendments are appropriate or not. But then again, the Supreme Court has interpreted them quite well. And so the point of the division of labor and the separation of power, except for the period of emergency, I think uh, I will call it a dhabba on the entire constitution process, uh, the, except for H.R. Khanna, who played a heroic role, I think the Supreme Court did not come up to the occasion at that time. But after that, maintaining the rights of the individual with all the limitations because the constitution itself did not provide complete absolute right to the individual. There are a lot of conditions applied and there are ample reasons given for it and I think Ambedkar really clarified it very well. For instance, I'd like to give an example that when he was describing the what the constitution achieved he made two points about the communist absence and the socialist one. He says the communist absence is of course because they don't want a constitutional democracy. They want a dictatorship of the proletariat. And the socialists want the absolute nature of fundamental rights, which cannot be acceptable. And I think slowly, if you really look to the Supreme Court judgments, you will also find that increasingly direct uh, principles have also assumed some kind of a position, not exactly in a fundamental sense, but in the application sense, the status of the fundamental right. So in that way, I think the social balancing that Ambedkar wished, the Constitution has achieved, and mind you that a very interesting point, in the context of today, nobody says that we should have a new Constitution, rather people do demand uh, amendments, but the basic structure of the Constitution continues. If I take this um, matter further, first let me submit that the Constitution of India is not the name of an inert document only. It is a dynamic process and the Constitution making is started much before the Constitution Assembly was set up. It was the Constitution of India was being made throughout the period of British rule and throughout the period freedom struggle was being waged and demands were being put. Constitution making has also continued after 26 November 1949 and 26 January 1950. It is still continuing. So my point is it should be taken as a dynamic process, as a continuing exercise. Second very important point that you raised about amendments. We cannot generalize about amendments. One Constitution of India cannot be fitted into any of the existing models from the point of view of rigidity or flexibility. Our Constitution adopts a middle path. It is rigid in certain matters. It is very flexible in other matters. We often forget that there are a large number of provisions in the Constitution which can be amended by simple law by Parliament. They don't have to go to Article 368, which is for amendment of the Constitution. Article 368 also provides different majorities for amendment of the Constitution. In some cases, the two houses of Parliament, by two-third majority, etc., can pass an amendment and they, with President's assent, the Constitution stands amended. In uh, other cases, the state assemblies, state legislatures have also to approve it, more than 50%. But apart from this 368, a large number of provisions as I said, provide something like this until otherwise provided by Parliament by law, which means uh, if you pick up the Constitution, copy of the Constitution, and note down all the provisions where it is left to Parliament to provide by law, you will find that a large number of provisions can be amended by Parliament by a simple majority of which is not often mentioned when we talk of the 
amendment of the constitution. Of course, in two cases, it is mentioned in the constitution itself that it can be done by parliament, by majority. But in other cases, where it is provided until otherwise provided by parliament, by law, most of the things are governed under that. Professor Mukherjee, what is so powerful about Indian constitution? One very important reason for the success of Indian constitution is first the existence of a well organized political party and second of course the civil service was there, a competent neutral civil service with some sense of justice, you know the British sense of justice already ingrained through the freedom struggle. The second important point of the success of the Indian constitution, the way it was formulated. And there I think, apart from Ambedkar's role, one should mention the role of what Austin calls the oligarchy of four. That is, you see Rajendra Prashad, the chairman, uh, Pandit Nehru, and Azad, and Patel. And there it is created in the constitution, smoothing the edges. And that's how it flourished. And now coming to the present context, I think two important uh, things are to be noted. One is that every country has a political culture of its own. Because unless and until there is a larger consensus in the entire nation about the limit of politics and uh, limit of changing it, then conflict will continue to be endemic. Here I would also like to point out that another need of a culture is to develop that the opposition is also a part of the government. So opposition and uh, the government benches should work in a coordinated manner to filter the, you know, the demand of society to the appropriate level of parliament and take decision. One of the very important reasons for the success of liberal democracy is that it can really continue to accept changes without uh, mass demonstration or non-violent means because of its capacity to be flexible. And as Kashyapji said, that the Indian constitution provides that because it is both flexible and rigid, and most of the cases it is flexible enough to accommodate any reasonable demand. You are listening to a special program, Preparations for India's 73rd Republic Day Celebrations. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. You can listen to it on our mobile app, News on AIR. This program is also available on our YouTube channel, News on AIR Official. You may email your opinion about this program at airnsdtalks at gmail.com.